Hey guys, today we're going to make a little trip from Lafayette, Louisiana to Abbeville. And we're going to answer one of those burning questions that I've been having, which is mile per gallon versus gear. In other words, what's our mile per gallon in sixth gear and what is it in fifth gear and what is it, what is it in fourth gear at the same speed? So we're going to do a series of tests and then we're going to go back home and put it all together and look at it because there's too much going on to try to make sense of it while we're driving and talking about it and uh, we'll wait and do that after we get back to the house. Now these mile per gallon readings you're going to see here is instantaneous readings. Uh, that's by no means, you know, accurate in terms of calculated mile per gallon, but they're relative. Uh, the conditions are all the same, flat road, basically no wind. Uh, you know, typical flat, straight Louisiana road. We're also going to look at uh, load and uh, exhaust gas temperature. Hadn't really planned on it, but kind of got a three for one here because as it turns out, uh, it was kind of interesting. And uh, we'll look at that here in a little bit. You know, Chrysler, we all know what load is. You guys know what load, load is. I'm not going to insult your intelligence by trying to explain what load is. But Chrysler has a little bit definition of load. They report it in percentage from the power control module. And I'm guessing it's for emissions reasons. But nonetheless, uh, we, were, we did plot it out and look at it. And it was interesting. And uh, so was uh, his exhaust gas temperature. And we're going to talk about that as it relates to uh, active regenerations. So let's go back to the house and take a look at that and uh, see what it all looks like. Okay guys, so we got back from our little trip to Abbeville and I went back through my GoPro video and I looked at all my, my numbers and I wrote them down and I put them on an Excel spreadsheet where we can make more sense out of them than just driving along looking at numbers jumping around. So on this chart, we're going to look at speed, mile per gallon, and load. And on the next graph, we're going to look at exhaust temperature. I didn't want to mix exhaust temperature in here because I had to put it over here. And uh, it just complicates the, the chart. So speed, of course, what, what we did on the test was we ran 50, 55, and 60, and 65 mile per hour. And at each one of those speeds, basically took three readings. In sixth gear, fifth gear, and fourth gear. And my goal was to find out how my mile per gallon is affected running in the various gears at the same speed, but in, as Cummins would call it, gear down. In other words, dropping a gear. And this will be most interesting when I take my travel trail out the next time and we can do this test with the, uh, with the RV behind me. And I think it will be interesting to look at these numbers again. I think we'll see this same trend. But I think, it, I think this line is going to straighten out quite a bit because we'll, we'll see less percentage. You know, we got 32 to to 30 here from 6th to 5th, you know, maybe we might drop a quarter of a mile per gallon. I don't know. I don't, I'm guessing. I have no idea. But the reason I did this in the first place was to answer that question. How does running, running a gear down affect mile per gallon? Well, we got the answer to that here. And, that's, that's, uh, and that was really my only goal. But we found some found out a few other things too as we did this. Uh, if we, uh, whoops, didn't mean to do that. Uh, if we uh, look at the the trend, you can see that regardless of what gear we in or what speed we're going, two things stand out: the faster you go, the less mile per gallon you get, and the lower gear you run in, the less mile per gallon you get. So that 
you know, that's kind of obvious probably to some people, but me being a simpleton, I like to look at it. Look, I like to look at my gauge, <laughs> and I like to, uh, I like to kind of, you know, see it, and I can see it on this chart here after I put down all these numbers. Now load, uh, that was just kind of a little side benefit. I, I didn't even think I was going to record it, but I said, well, what the hell? Let's look at load. And, you know, a lot of engineers would probably argue about what's the definition of load because it's kind of a mystical value. It's, uh, as I heard one person say, it's dimensionless. But um, you can really look at load as torque being used. But kind of a book definition for load is... And we don't know how Chrysler calculates load on that truck, and it's probably used for emissions purposes and stuff, and I think it has to do with throttle position and other things, but I really don't know. But I think a fair definition for this test here, uh, engine load is a comparison of the actual engine output torque to the maximum engine, engine output torque at the current operating speed engine speed so at each one of these engine speeds we can read our torque used or if you want to use the term load I think either one applies so if we look at six gear at 50 miles an hour we use in 26 percent of our available torque or the engine is 26% loaded. All this is in percentage is the way it's reported through the uh, power control module on the truck. As we drop gear down one to fifth at 50, we, uh, we take some of the load off the engine and we're only using 16% now. And then as we go to fourth, we're only using 9%. So we've got, you know, assuming you've got 100%, you've got 91% of your vehicle torque left. So and I, I'm not inferring that anybody's going to run in fifth gear pulling a load at 50 miles an hour. This is really the area over here that I was most in, interested in. But I thought while I'm doing it, I'm going to do it at a variation of speeds. I could have went up to 70. I never pull my travel trail at 70. But uh, in fact, my tire is only good for 65. I've got C-rated uh, tires. And... Uh, I really need to change them. But anyway, uh, and Cummins is pretty emphatic about that. Uh, the, the other thing, too, and what they're emphatic about is the slower you run, the slower RPMs you turn, the better your fuel mileage is going to be, and you're going to have less wear and tear on your engine. And they use the, and. They also use the word drivability when they talk about uh, performance, particularly to the driver. And of course, they're they're doing this in most of the stuff that I read on a Cummins website is as though they're talking to the owner of the vehicle or the trucking company when they talk about sizing an engine. And you don't want to size an engine too big because the driver is going to have the tendency to run faster and harder and accelerate harder and use more fuel and, you know, more wear and tear and all those kind of things. So, you know, they geared toward getting you maximum mile per gallon. But there is a aspect of drivability, and that's the first place I've ever seen that term used, drivability. But you could see... And I know all of you guys have, have have seen this. Anybody that's ever pulled a, a load, a trailer, or anything has witnessed this. Drivability can be a real pain in the ass. Not at 50 miles an hour because we're not going to be pulling 
nothing in sixth gear at 50 miles an hour. But if you get over here, you know, I like to drive somewhere between 60 and 65. 65 usually because my wife wants to get there fast. I enjoy the trip. She enjoys getting there. There's nothing I enjoy more than pulling that trailer down the highway and looking at all those gauges. <laughs> but anyway, uh, the uh, you know when you get over here and you're doing uh, you're in six gear and you're bucking a headwind and you're up and down hills or even sometimes when you just hit an overpass your transmission shifts down uh to the next gear you know that that's just a pain in the ass and it's unnecessary to me my personal opinion it's unnecessary wear and tear on your on your transmission and and everything else your drivetrain so that's the drivability aspect the way i look at drivability so I rarely drive in in, in uh, six gear unless I can get a good tailwind and uh, you know there's no uh, no hills, good flat country stuff like that because I, I don't want to run up a hill and have my truck shifting down the fifth or even sometimes fourth when you get into the real hilly stuff. So I'll find whatever. Whichever one of these gears that I can drive in, and it'll hold it, and it'll run up and down those hills, and I'll lock it, lock it in with my uh, with my shifter there, and my uh, my cruise control, and that's the way I'll run all day long until I can get to a point where I feel like I can shift up a gear, but. Uh, and that's rarely in six with with my setup. I just don't have the uh, don't have the um, I'm I'm turning to a low low RPMs if I'm running anything less than say 65 or you know you get up into the 70 range you can run in six gear easier because you're getting up further into that better torque range. But uh, and higher RPMs. But anyway, uh, enough about that. I think I think you guys know what I'm talking about when we talk about drivability. So I thought this chart was interesting. Uh, let's go ahead and take a look at uh, our uh, exhaust gas temperature now, and we'll see what effect that had what these uh, conditions had on exhaust gas temperature and the reason I wanted to look at that has to do with the uh, DPF active regeneration and we're going to talk about that right now so let me switch charts okay guys let's talk about exhaust gas temperature and how it's affected by driving a gear down or two gears down in other words I did the same thing I took these readings when I took those other readings it's just on a different chart and all we got is a graph of exhaust gas temperature here we've got degrees Fahrenheit here and we've got our as I said speed three three readings at 50 55 etc 654, 654, 654. So, and the reason I wanted to do this was a question that I saw on the, one of the forums or somewhere. And it was when you're in an active regen, that's assuming you can tell. My gauge tells me when I'm in an active regen. But, Will the DPF go through an active regen quicker running a gear down? In other words, let's say you're running at 45 miles an hour. You have no choice but to run at 45 miles an hour because of traffic or whatever reasons and you're in a regen. Well, the question I had was, uh, will it go through quicker 
if you gear down and raise your RPMs, will the engine run hotter and therefore provide more passive heat and uh, it would require less fuel dumped into the exhaust and less, uh, uh, you know, do a quicker, a quicker regen from the oxidation of the fuel and the burning of the of the soot, et cetera, et cetera. So, as you can see here, and this was pretty enlightening because I'll tell you the truth, I have a tendency to to want to do that is when I know I'm in a region, gear down and run at a lower gear and crank my RPMs up because I think, well, I'm raising my exhaust temperature. Of course, I'm looking at exhaust temperature on my my monitor, so I probably should have paid more attention to that. But uh, as you can see, it makes no difference at all. Sixth, you got 475 degrees Fahrenheit. Fourth, you got 476. And you're going to have some variation because of just road conditions and, you know, little gust of wind or whatever, it's not going to be perfect. This line here, that's just transitioning from from 50 to 55. That probably shouldn't even be in there. Uh, because once you get to 55, you can see you stable out again, regardless of the gear. Here's 6th, 522, 5th, 522, and 4th, 528. So there's, you know, there's just no change. And then we go up to 60 miles an hour, same thing, straight line. We go up to 65, same thing. Actually dropped a little bit, but I think that's just, as I said, variation in road conditions and minor, minor changes in, in uh, operating conditions. So that answers that question for me. No sense dropping a gear, wasting fuel, thinking that you're going to speed up your regen because you're, you're not, from, in my opinion. Because unless you can generate more exhaust gas temperature, you're really not going to increase the regen. The active regen is going to take care of it. Now, if you can get out on the highway and go faster, yes, you're definitely going to go through a faster regen, I would say, because you're getting help from the passive side of the, you know, from a little, little bit of passive regeneration going on along with the active regeneration, so it's not going to require as much fuel to go from 600 to, say, 1,100, 1,000 to 1,100, as it would to go from say 475 all the way up to a thousand to 1100. So my thought on that is, yeah, get out on the highway if if you have the opportunity and you know you're in a region, you know, and get up there and run run uh, at a good clip. In fact, when I'm towing, I never I'm never in a region because my exhaust temperature is a up there in a seven eight hundred range and that is enough to burn off the soot that is uh, being generated this is enough to burn off the soot actually if you can just stay on the highway at this speed soot starts to burn off way down low i read somewhere it's 390 something degrees but it's 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 so little that it's not enough you can't keep up the truck is generating more soot then you can burn off at 400 degrees but that's you know that's a subject for another day so anyway I wanted to show you this because I thought this was a interesting side note of that little trip I made and uh, it does answer that question of the GP the DPF filter active regeneration and uh, I hope this didn't put you to sleep for too long and uh thanks for watching guys and we'll see you next time adios